In our previous video, we just finished talking about calorimetry a little bit. And we can use calorimetry to measure how much reaction a, or how much energy a reaction gives off, but it's not something that we want to have to do every single time we hit a new system or try a new chemical reaction. Instead, it would be handy for us to have a set of standard values for some reactions or something and be able to use them in order to calculate how much energy was released or absorbed by some other reaction. And we do this using a principle called Hess's Law. And Hess's Law really isn't a law exactly, um, and it's just a simple acknowledgement that since energy is path independent, we can find any path, any convenient path, to get us to the reaction we want. And what that really means is that if we can figure out a way to uh, do a calculation that gets us to the reaction that we want, then the energy for the reaction will be exactly the one that we're looking for. So sometimes this means that we combine reactions and cancel out parts we don't want um, or that we don't need in order to get the reaction that we want. So let's take a couple of examples because this is otherwise it's really hard to kind of get your head around what we're talking about. So let's look at this reaction. If we take coal and we react it with oxygen, normally we think about it making carbon dioxide, but it can also make carbon monoxide gas, which is a toxic gas. And so we might want to just be able to study the carbon monoxide gas and find out what the reaction enthalpy is for it. The problem is that if we try and do this directly, we always get a mixture of both carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide gases. And so we can't just get a, a clean measurement with our calorimeter for just the carbon monoxide. So in order to get around this, we're gonna do a couple of things. What we can do is we can look at the reaction of the, um, the coal with the oxygen to make just carbon dioxide. And as long as you have enough oxygen that's present in this reaction, this reaction will run cleanly to make pure carbon dioxide. And in fact, we've measured this enthalpy to be minus 393.5. These are combustion reactions, and so um, most of them are going to be uh, exothermic. But we can also take carbon monoxide gas that, you know, maybe we produced it using this reaction, and we can purify the carbon monoxide from the carbon dioxide. And we can react it with some more oxygen to make more carbon dioxide gas. And this is what happens inside the catalytic converter of your car, that you have a, a mechanism there that flushes extra oxygen to make sure we don't have a bunch of toxic gases coming out of your tailpipe. So this is also an exothermic reaction that is well understood. And um, this is the energy that's associated with it. So I've got these two reactions how does this actually help us? So what we can see is that if we take this reaction right here, um, and then if we reverse reaction two, and we add them together, that we can uh, get you some algebra to get us to the reaction that we want. So I'm actually going to not reverse that reaction. I'm going to first do it um, this other way. So what I'm going to point out is that if we have this reaction that we're actually interested in, carbon and one half an oxygen, making carbon monoxide, and if we add that to our reaction B, Let's see what happens. We don't know this reaction enthalpy. This is our unknown. But we do know this reaction enthalpy. Oops. 
a little eraser. We can do that. Okay, good deal. So what we can acknowledge is that when we add these two reactions together, our carbon monoxide molecules would cancel out. And what we would get is this reaction. These two one-half O2s add up to make one whole O2. And we know that this reaction has a reaction enthalpy of minus 393.5 kilojoules. So what this tells us is that if we take our unknown enthalpy and we add it to our reaction B enthalpy, they have to add up to this amount, minus 393.5 kilojoules. Since these two reactions added together, the energies have to add together too because we're taking a slightly different path. We're going through this path first, and then this one, and that's gonna get us to this path that has an energy that we understand. So that means that we can just solve for the unknown by adding 283 to both sides. And we will get for our unknown reaction, an enthalpy of 155, sorry, minus 155.5 kilojoules. And this is the one that we didn't know and that we wanted. Okay, so let's look at this a slightly different way. Here's my reaction A and my reaction B. The other way that we can look at this is we can say, look, this reaction, if we reverse this reaction, the carbon dioxides will be able to cancel out, and one half of these oxygens will cancel out, and this will be our product that we want. Let me show you. So this is the same thing, we're just looking at it as a version two. So we have carbon and oxygen making carbon dioxide and this is the reaction that has minus 393.5 kilojoules and now we're going to reverse the other reaction so we have carbon dioxide now being split into carbon monoxide and one half of an oxygen. Now this reaction is the same one that I had right over here. This reaction B. Now when we reverse a reaction, notice that we also have to reverse the energy. Remember if we go forward with one reaction and it releases 283.0 kilojoules, then if we re reverse that reaction, it's now going to absorb 283.0 kilojoules. So that's the only change that we need to make, is that our energy now is positive 283.0 kilojoules. So our carbon dioxides cancel out, one half of my oxygen cancels out, and our net reaction is exactly the one that we're looking for. And if we add these energies together, that's going to be the energy that we're looking for, too. And this is exactly the same number that we just had, minus 155.5 kilojoules. So you can see we can look at these reactions in multiple different ways. And we have these tools of the reversibility of reactions. So that's what we did right here, where we reversed this, the order of this reaction, and then we just changed the sign on this reaction. We acknowledge that rather than releasing energy when we burn the carbon monoxide, we're going to absorb energy if we split apart that carbon dioxide gas because it takes energy to break that bond. Okay, so let's go ahead and try this again with a new set of reactions to make sure that we're feeling really comfortable with this part of Hess's Law. 
All right, so let's say that we're interested in the amount of energy that it takes to split water vapor into highly reactive hydroxyl radical, and this is also reactive, a hydrogen atom by itself. So this happens in the atmosphere a lot. A hydroxyl radical is actually one of the main gases that's responsible for cleaning other pollutant gases out of the air. So, um, so this is constantly happening. All right, so we don't know what the energy is for this reaction, but the information that we have is about some of these other gases. So we have the information that if we react one half of an H2 and one half of an O2, we can make hydroxyl radical and the energy of associated with this is 42.1 kilojoules. We also have the information that if you want to break apart one hydrogen molecule into two hydrogen atoms, it takes quite a bit of energy. It takes 435.9 kilojoules. And then we also have this information that if we react uh, H2 and half of an O2, we can make, make a water molecule or really probably a mole of them. And this actually releases some energy. So when we look at these reactions, what we're going to try and do is figure out what do we need to do to rearrange these so that stuff will cancel out and get us the reaction that we're looking for. So what I usually do is I go through the reaction I want and then I go through the reactions I have and I look to see if there's anything obvious like I need to rearrange some parts. So, like I need to switch order. So let's look. I don't have any water molecules in my first reaction or my second reaction, but I have one in my third reaction. It's on the wrong side though. So that means I'm gonna switch the order for C. So I'm going to reverse that one. It's going to be H2 is now, or excuse me, H2O is now making the H2 and the 1 half O2. And I'm splitting this water apart into its elements. And that's going to take energy. And it's just going to be the opposite amount that it was before. All right, so let's see what else I can see. I have an OH right here and an OH right here, so those look pretty good. I'm just going to leave A alone. And make some OH. And the energy is just going to be as written. So let's see what else I have. I have one H by itself. So if I look at reaction B, I can see that I make two H's for this one. So I, what I really need is I just need one half of this reaction B. So if I take one half of reaction B, what I need to do is also divide this energy by two. Because remember, energy is extensive. It, it depends on how much stuff we have. So if we have half as much stuff, it's going to take half as much energy. So that energy, half of 435.9, is going to be about <clears throat> 200 and, what did I say here, 18.0 kilojoules. So let's take a look and see whether or not things are going to cancel out for us now. All right, let's look. So I can see one of my oxygens cancels out here. And those two guys cancel out there. And now I have exactly what I want. So I have my water molecule breaking apart to make one OH and one H. And my reaction enthalpy is going to be all of these guys added up. So 241.8 plus 42.1 plus 218.0, which 
is going to be my answer. 501.9, I think is what I'm getting here. So you can see that this reaction enthalpy is a pretty high energy one. It takes quite a bit of energy to split these up in these, into these two reactive species. So hopefully through these examples, you can see that this is just one way of using Hess's law to rearrange chemical reactions to get the chemical reaction we want. Remember, we're just taking a different path. Now, one of the things that we often use in Hess's law are formation equations. In fact, we've used some of them here. We just didn't notice that that's what they were. So a formation equation is a very specific type of chemical reaction where we make one mole or molecule of our desired product, whatever that molecule is, and that's the only product, and we're making it out of stoichiometric amounts of pure elements in their natural elemental state. So let's take a look at what I mean. If we go back over here, we can see that OH, we're making one unit out of it, and we're making it out of the natural elements, or the elements in their natural elemental state, and the exact stoichiometric quantity. So one half of an H2 make, gives us one H here, and one half of an O2 gives us an O. So we're making the OH out of the elements, their pure elements, not compounds over here on the reactant side, in their pure elemental state. The same thing is true here for the water. We're making water out of exact stoichiometric amounts of the elements H2 and O2 in their natural elemental state. H2 and O2 are both diatomic molecules if we go out in nature. So these are examples of formation equations. Look at a couple, let's look at a couple more formation equations. So let's say we wanted to make sodium chloride. Sodium chloride has two elements in it. It has sodium, and sodium is a metal, so it will be um, just the element in its natural elemental, elemental state, which is solid. Chlorine is a halogen, and so it appears as chlorine gas in nature. And stoichiometrically, we need one half of that. Let's try another one. Aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide is made from aluminum. Aluminum exists in nature as a solid. Well, actually, most commonly it's in aluminum oxide form, but that's okay. Its pure elemental state is aluminum. And then we have oxygen. Oxygen is a diatomic gas. And in order to get three of them, we need one and a half or three halves of an oxygen molecule. All right, let's try another one. How about this one? It has a little bit more going on. Iron nitrate. Why don't you give that one a try? Okay, so, and also I wanted to point out, it really doesn't matter what order you write the elements in. So we have one iron. It will be in solid form. We have a total of two nitrogens. Nitrogen is a diatomic gas, so that would be N2. And then we have oxygen again, and we've got a total of three times two is six. So we'll have three whole oxygen molecules. This would be the formation equation. So why don't you try a couple more on your own? Let's try calcium carbonate and borohydride and ammonium nitrate. Pause the video and give those a try. Welcome back. Hopefully what you found was we have calcium. Carbon exists as a solid, as coal. And then we have three halves O2, getting us the, ox the three oxygens that we need. Uh, boron is sort of a weird element. I'm pretty sure in nature it appears just as boron solid. 
and then we would have three H2 gases. Over here, we've got one whole nitrogen molecule, two whole hydrogen molecules, and three halves of NO2. Okay, so formation equations are going to be really important going forward here. And what we find is that we have tables of enthalpy of reaction values that are specifically for these formation values. And in the next video, we're going to look at how we use these tabulated values for, um, to do all kinds of other chemical reactions. So if you found this process of canceling out equations a little bit awkward, don't worry. I'm mostly not going to do it this way. Um, I show you this because it is one of the ways that we can use Hess's law, but we almost always just use our formation values, and I'll show you how to, how to find uh, the total reaction enthalpy using formation values next.